Good morning, everyone. It's good to have you here again with us this morning as we now have released this next video on our sermon series. As we go through this unprecedented time, we see governments and businesses, healthcare facilities, schools, churches, families, individuals, all doing things differently. The concern over the health and well-being of the world prompted some drastic measures. It was believed by those implementing them that this was necessary for the time. Something new had to be done to face the future. We're continuing on in our study in the book of Joel. So open your Bibles with me to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Chapter 2. And we'll look at verses 28 to 32 today. Joel chapter 2. Verses 28 to 32. After this, I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams and your young men will see visions. I will even pour out my spirit on the male and female servants of those days. I will display wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awe-inspiring day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of Yahweh will be saved. For there will be an escape for those on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, as the Lord promised, among the survivors the Lord calls. Here we see an interesting prophecy about the coming of the Holy Spirit. You may recall that in the Old Testament the Spirit would come on people for occasions, like Samson in Judges chapter 14. Look with me to Judges. Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Judges chapter 14. Judges chapter 14. And we'll look at verses 5 and 6. Judges 14, verses 5 and 6. Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Suddenly a young lion came roaring at him. The Spirit of the Lord took control of him, and he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. But he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. The Spirit of God came on him for a moment of need to overcome some difficulty. King David and the prophet Ezekiel stated that the Spirit came upon them to write the word in Psalm 143 and Ezekiel 36 respectively. We don't see the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament like we see described in this passage of Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. Let's look at this passage closer. In Joel 28, Joel 2, verse 28, he says, After this. And the question is, after what? In chapter 2, Joel has just described an invading army in the time of Jacob's trouble. Let's look at verse 20 of chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, verse 20, I will drive the northerner far from you and banish him to a dry and desolate land, his front ranks into the Dead Sea and his rear guard into the Mediterranean Sea. His stench will rise. Yes, his rotten smell will rise, for he has done catastrophic things. He describes the destruction of this invader and the blessing upon Israel to restore all that had been lost here in chapter 2. After this event, after the great war against Israel, where God comes in and intervenes in a powerful way to wipe out all of the enemies with a sword from his mouth, his spoken word, as is described in Revelation 19. After this, God will pour out his spirit on all humanity. This is a unique time. We see in the Old Testament that the spirit was for special occasions and didn't reside in all the believers, but on Pentecost, which is today, God poured out his spirit onto the believers in Jerusalem. Turn with me to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And let us, let's look at what Jesus has told and instructed the disciples. Acts chapter 1, and we'll look at verses 4 through 8. While he, speaking of Jesus, was together with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise. This, he said, is what you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, at this time are you restoring the kingdom of Israel? 
He said to them, It is not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Jesus tells them that they will receive the Holy Spirit. He calls it being baptized in the Spirit. This happens to every believer at the time of their conversion. Look with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll read verses 12 and 13. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 and 13. For as the body is one and has many parts, all the parts of that body, though many, are one body, so also is Christ. For we are all baptized by one Spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. And we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Paul tells us that every believer is baptized in the Holy Spirit. There are different gifts of the Spirit, but everyone is baptized in the Holy Spirit upon faith in Jesus. There isn't a special baptism that comes on some. Jesus and Paul both refer to a believer receiving the Holy Spirit as a baptism. In 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about the body of Christ, the church, as having different parts, different roles, different manifestations of the Spirit, but we're all baptized in the Holy Spirit. This happened on Pentecost. There are seven feasts in the Jewish calendar, three in the spring and three in the fall. And one in the spring, but it's in a different month than the other group of three in the spring. The first month of the Hebrew religious calendar is Nisan. Moses was told in Egypt that the month they were delivered from slavery was the first month of the year for them in Exodus chapter 12. There are three observances in Nisan, Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and First Fruits. Jesus beautifully fulfilled these prophetic feasts in his first coming. He died as the sacrificial lamb of Passover, and through his blood shed and through faith in him, we escape eternal death. He is without yeast, which was a symbol of sin in the Old Testament. So he fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread as being the bread of life, as he testified about himself in John chapter 6. And he is the first fruits of those raised from the dead, as Paul describes and tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In fact, his resurrection on Sunday was at the same time as they would have been waving the first fruits of the harvest in the temple. The Feast of Pentecost, Shavuot, is marked out 50 days from the first fruits celebration. This is called counting the Omer. The Omer is a sheaf of grain. This, along with his resurrection, was on a Sunday after Jesus ascended from the earth. His disciples waited in Jerusalem, and on the Feast of Pentecost, on Sunday, the church was born. According to the sages, the new moon of Nisan, that first month of the, of the calendar year, marks the start of sacred time. Passover remembers the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. The first day of unleavened bread remembers the exodus from Egypt. The seventh day of, of unleavened bread remembers the crossing of the Red Sea. The counting of the Omer recalls the days before giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai, and Shavuot remembers the giving of the Torah exactly seven weeks after the exodus. Indeed, Shavuot, or Pentecost, at Mount Sinai is sometimes considered the day on which Judaism was born. Judaism was born at the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai, and the church was born at the giving of the Spirit on Mount Zion, Jerusalem, on the same day as the Torah was given. God was doing something new here. Never had the Spirit been given in this way for all the followers of God. This was for a season of unprecedented work of God on the whole earth. When God called a man, Abraham, he set his life on a new course. In the ancient world, a man would have done what his fathers did. He would have followed the cycles of birth and life and death, winter, spring, summer, fall, everything following the same cycle as it always had. God sprung Abraham out of this and gave him a new destiny. All nations would be blessed through him. God made them a nation as they sojourned in Egypt. He brought them out of Egypt into the promised land. God called a man made him a family, they went to Egypt, then he brought a nation out of Egypt. As Moses received the law on Mount Sinai in Arabia, God began something new with this ethnic group. 
he was initiating something that had never been done before. He brought them into a land, Canaan, the promised land now called Israel. He put his people there and they built the temple there in Jerusalem to do the requirements of the law, this sacrificial system. As Judaism was born on Mount Sinai, we see that this system was ethnically locked, the Jews. It was landlocked, the promised land of Israel. It was city locked in Jerusalem and building locked in the temple. The people had to go to Jerusalem for three of the feasts of the, of the year, Passover, Pentecost, and Feast of Booths. On Pentecost, the day the church was born, God was doing something new. He was pouring out his spirit on the believers. He told them to go into all the world and make disciples of all people. We see in Revelation the description of an unnumbered mass of people being from every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. No longer was God exclusive to one ethnic group, the Jews. He was spreading his church around the world. No longer was it exclusive to one country, to Israel. He was no longer requiring people to go to Jerusalem for feast and sacrifice at the temple because he fulfilled the law. Jesus even saw fit to make sure that going to the temple wasn't done by every nation, tribe, tongue, and people by prophesying that the temple would be destroyed. Something new was being done when the church was born because God had a new mission that required his spirit to come on all believers to reach the whole world. Let's look back again at Joel uh, 2 and 28 and 29. Joel chapter 2 verses 28 and 29. After this, I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams and your young men will see visions. I will even pour out my spirit on the male and female slaves in those days. So God now is going to pour his spirit on all humanity and there will be something unique taking place. People will prophesy, dream dreams, and have visions. When is this happening? After this, Joel says. After what? The end of the war against Israel. The end of the time of Jacob's trouble. This will be something different than Mount Sinai. Different from the beginning of the church on Mount Zion. God will do something new. What a glorious expression of God's infinite creativity. God will be doing something new. In the Old Testament, when Joel wrote, the people would not have fully understood what all this was meaning. They didn't see this fulfilled in their day. You'll remember I talked about how God gave near and far prophecies to the prophets so that the people who saw the near prophecy fulfilled could count on the far prophecy to come to pass. It was like a guarantee that God was giving to them that he was a promise keeper and his prophecies will come true. So the people in Joel's day we're going to see a near prophecy to validate this coming pouring out of the Spirit. No, they didn't. But the church did. In Acts chapter 2, let's turn to Acts chapter 2 and let's see now this event. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, and we'll read through verse 21. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. And tongues like flames of fire that were divided appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different languages as the Spirit gave them ability for speech. There were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven, when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. And they were astounded and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our languages the magnificent acts of God. And they were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, What could this be? But some sneered and said, Ah, oh, they're full of new wine. But Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed to them, Jewish men and all you residents of Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk, 
as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on male and female slaves in those days and they will prophesy. I will display wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and remarkable day of the Lord comes. Then whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter at Pentecost quotes Joel chapter 2 verses 28 to 32. The Jews didn't understand what was meant by the Spirit of God being poured out on everyone. So God revealed his plan on Sunday, on Pentecost, the birth of the church. This was the first time this had ever been experienced, but it isn't the fulfillment of Joel 2. It is the foreshadowing of what it will be like on that day, or as Joel put it, after this. How do we know this Pentecost, the birth of the church, isn't the fulfillment of Joel? We have to consider the whole testimony from Joel 2. In Joel 2 verse 28, Joel writes that all humanity will get the Spirit. Did that happen on Pentecost? No. Pentecost is the near prophecy fulfillment, guaranteeing the far prophecy fulfillment after the time of Jacob's trouble. God was doing something new when he created the church. He opened up faith in him to all humanity, and this foreshadows the time when all humanity will get his spirit. In verses, verses 30 and 31 of Joel 2, Joel then comes back to the day of the Lord that he introduced in chapter 1, verse 15. There will be a, these will be terrifying things happening in the sky to testify that the time of the end of the trouble is near. The spirit being poured out is just on the horizon. And in verse 32 of Joel 2, Joel tells us that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is exactly what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10. Look at Romans chapter 10 with me. And we'll pick up in verse 9. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. With the heart one believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth one confesses, re resulting in salvation. Now the Spirit says, no one who believes on him will be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, since the same Lord of all is rich to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God did something new when he broke Abraham out of the ancient world's cycles of everything going as it always had. God did something new by giving a child to Abraham and Sarah when they were so old. God did something new when he saved Abraham's descendants by sending down one of them as a slave only to become second in command of Egypt, Joseph. God did something new when he brought them out and gave them the law on Pentecost. He did something new when he brought them into a specific land, a specific city, Jerusalem, and a specific building, the temple. He did something new when he tore down division of people group, land, city, and building, and opened up the gift of his spirit to all who believed from every nation, tribe, and people. God will do something new when he marches out to rescue the Jews from the hostility of the world towards them, and Jesus sets up his kingdom on earth. Paul describes this beautiful coming together of the church and the Jews this way. Look with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And we'll look at verses 11 to 22. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. So then, remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcision, done by hand in the flesh, at that time you were without the Messiah, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, with no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were far away, again speaking now of the Gentiles, have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. For he is our peace, who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. In his flesh he did away with the law of Moses, 
of the commandments and regulations, so that he might create in himself one new man from the two, resulting in peace. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross and put the hostility to death by it. When Christ came, he proclaimed the good news of peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles, uh, speaking of the New Testament, and the prophets, speaking of the Old Testament, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone. The whole building is being fitted together in him and is growing into a holy sanctuary in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. God tore down the barrier of the temple and the Mosaic law, literally, when it was destroyed in AD 70. He wants a union to take place, and this is only possible through the pouring out of his Spirit. Those who are far away, the Gentiles, and those who are near, the Jews, will be one someday. This will be when Jesus sets up his kingdom on earth, and all who call on the name of the Lord are saved and are filled with his Spirit. Pentecost looks forward to that day of the Lord's kingdom on earth, with him sitting on the throne of David. We read in Romans 10 that if you believe with your heart that Jesus is risen from the dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, he is God and in charge of your life. You will be saved. Have you done this? Joel describes the day of the Lord as a terrible day. God will pour out his wrath on the earth to punish the wicked. You can be saved from this and the second death as described in Revelation as a lake of fire with torment day and night forever. Praying to God is simply talking to him. Do you want to know this work of the Holy Spirit in your life? The baptism that comes through faith in Jesus gives you the privilege to be raised up at the last day. It is the guarantee of his calling on you and his coming for you. Jesus said that he has gone to prepare a place for us, and if he goes, he will come again, so that where he is, we can also be. As you remember Pentecost, the beginning of the church, you can also reflect on the promise that he will come again, and all creation will know the presence of his Spirit. That will be a great and glorious day that follows the great and terrible day of the Lord. You have today to choose. Why not choose Jesus and come to him for your salvation? He loves you so much. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The things of this world are empty and unsatisfying. There is pleasure for a moment. But when it is done, there is no longing peace, long-lasting peace or hope. The world is doing something different to deal with this unique time in history. God did something different on Pentecost, guaranteeing the prophecy about when he will do something different and make the two, the Jew and the church, one. We rejoice in the way that God does new things. Spring is a time of remembrance of that. Pentecost is a time of remembrance of that. God wants to do something new in your life today. Will you accept him and know that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for the giving of your Son. and Lord Jesus, as you sent your Spirit uh, to begin your work through the church, to reach every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, it will be a terrible and dreadful day, the day of the Lord, when you come to defeat all the enemies of your people. And Lord, as you bring the two and make them into one, as you reign on your throne in the city of Jerusalem, on the throne of David, we will see peace like we've never known on this earth. We will finally understand many of the prophecies that pointed to that day of you sitting on that throne. We look forward to it and long for it. God, I pray that you would bring peace to those of your children who are, who are struggling during this season of unique uh, difficulties. Lord, I pray for those that are without jobs. I pray that you would meet their needs and provide for them. Lord, for those that are sick, we ask God that you bring healing. Give wisdom to those who are in leadership that they might make decisions that honor you and are for the betterment of our, uh, of our nation. Lord, I pray that you would also bless us with the patience that is required to endure. Lord, that you would keep us from being discouraged. That would remind us to pray for those that are in leadership, to bless those uh, that may curse us, that uh, 
that we would love our enemies, Lord, that we would be your ambassadors and represent you well on this earth until the day that we go to be with you. Lord, I pray that you would also bless us with the faith that we need, that we would understand that you have a plan and we can rest on that, and it is a guarantee. What you plan, you will do. And Lord, I pray that you pour out your spirit on this on this nation, that you would convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment, that, Heavenly Father, you would draw them to your Son, that, Lord Jesus, you would seek them, seek the lost to save them. Lord, we want to see a revival in your church, that your church would become alive in faith and in obedience, in holiness, and proclaiming the good news that, Lord Jesus, you died to save us from eternity in hell, to be with you forever. Lord Jesus, we look forward to the day that our faith will be sight. Lord Jesus, come. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for joining us today. If this is your first time, welcome. Uh, those of you who are familiar with our, our routine, I just wanted to remind you that we do have a prayer uh, request email. If you have something that you would like for me to pray about, please uh, send me a, a prayer request at the prayer at faithsaskatoon.ca email address. Uh, you're welcome to uh, look at more about who we are at our website. It's also listed below. And if God lays on your heart to support the ministry at Faith Baptist Church, there's a way to do an e-transfer also uh, listed below in the description. God bless you. Have a glorious day with the hope of his ever nearing return. To him be the glory in his church, both now and forever. Amen.